Hi everyone, we're going to go through the revision paper for the final exam for EP Math 127 for 2018 only because we've had a reduced week due to the uh, strike. So this is the similar layout to what you'll get in the 2018 final exam. There's no B5 content uh, and the other content's been distributed. So ratio and scale measurement, five marks. Well, express the ratio 196 to 16 in simplest form. Why is that not already in simplest form? It's got no units, which is good. It's got no fractions or decimal, which is good. But yeah, we can bring them down to the smallest form. Now, I could do it manually. I could, you know, halve this, divide by 4, divide by 8, maybe even divide by 16. But I'm just going to go to the calculator. What is 196 over 16? And the answer tells me it's the same as 49 on 4. So there it is, just going off the calculator. But sure, if I had said, look, I can see they're both divisible by 4. How many 4's in that? There's 4. How many 4's in 196? There's 49. Either way, that's the simplest form. B. Express 2 and a half hours to 15 minutes in simplest form. Well, like I just said, simplest form involves the same units, or no units. First you're making the same units, and then we don't need them anymore. I could convert 15 minutes to a quarter of an hour, or I could convert 2 and a half hours to 2 and a half times 60 minutes which would be 150 minutes. Either way, I prefer to go the minutes. Two and a half hours, two and a half times 60 is 150 minutes. So it's 150 minutes as a ratio to 15 minutes. Since they're both minutes, it's 150 whatevers to 15 of the same whatevers. And let's keep simplifying it. Clearly fives are in common. How many fives are in 15? Three. How many fives are in 150? Well, there's 30. And I can see there's still 3's in common. How many 3's in 3? 1. How many 3's in 30? There's 10. So it comes down to 10 to 1. And I can see that from the start. That yeah, 150 minutes to 15 minutes. If it had been smarter, I would have said, look, there's 115 in that and there's 10 15's in that. Uh, yeah, okay. Now the next one, a profit of $5,500 is to be split between Amy and Billy in the ratio 4 to 7. So we've got Amy here, Billy here, four here, seven here, we're splitting up $5,500. So in other words, we want to put four bits of it here and seven bits of it here. So four plus seven, that's 11 bits, 11 parts. So if I want to split $5,500 up into 11 parts, 5,500 divided by 11 is 500. So that means it's $500 each part. So four lots of 500 goes to the left, that's $2,000. 7 lots of 500 goes to the right, that's $3,500. And what was the actual question? How much will Billy get? Well, Billy's getting $3,500, that's A. The height of a building is shown as 6.8 centimetres on an architect's plans. If the actual building is 34 metres tall, what's the scale of the diagram? Is the ratio in simplest form? Well, these scale measurement ones are always scale to actual. It just told us the scaled item on the plans is 6.8 centimetres. And it told us the actual height it's representing is 34 metres. So there's the ratio, but let's get in simplest form. Let's go the same unit, so I'm going to do the small units again, like with hours and minutes, I chose minutes. With centimetres and metres, I choose centimetres. Leave the 6.8 centimetres as is. And 34 metres, since there's 100 centimetres in a metre, must be 3400 centimeters okay they're both centimeters now i've just got to simplify that i could do it manually like i was doing before or with the calculator here i'm definitely going to go to the calculator i'm going to do a, a 6.8 fraction so 6.8 over 3400 and it tells me my answer is 1 over 500 so there's it given to me straight from the calculator or of course i could have um like i said simplified manually but the calculator is your friend. There it is. Now we've got another scale measurement one here. If a distance is measured at 82 millimetres on a map, how many metres is this representing in real life? Okay, I'm just going to write scale to actual again. And it's drawn a scale of 1 to, what's that, 4,000. Okay. So that's already telling me that the scaled item is equivalent to 1. The actual is equivalent to 4,000. So clearly, actual, real life, is times 4,000 bigger than the scaled item. So the scaled item is small, the actual item is 4,000 times bigger. So if a distance is measured 82 millimeters on a map, well it's on the map, that's obviously the scaled one. 
So the 82 millimeters sits on the left, and we're asking, well, what's it actually worth? And when you can see from this, that left got times by 4,000 to become the right, so 82 millimeters times 4,000 will become the right. If I go to the calc, 82 times 4,000, well, it gives me quite a large number, 328000. That must be millimeters. But I know there's a thousand millimeters in every, what did it say, how many meters? Yeah, a thousand millimeters in every meter. So if I remove a thousand, it's the same as 328 meters. So there's my answer. Note I also could have said, look, one got times by 82 to become 82. So 4,000 should get times by 82. It would give me exactly the same number, 328,000 millimeters, which is 328 meters. Bit of trig, find the length of the hypotenuse of a right angled triangle given the other two sides are that and that. Well, we want the length of the hypotenuse, so it's a good old right angled triangle. The hypotenuse I'll call x, that'll do. The other two sides, doesn't matter which is which, it's a 4.6 centimeters and a 7.3 centimeters. So all I've got to use is Pythagoras' theorem that says the hypotenuse squared is equal to the sum of the other two sides squared. So in other words, x squared equals, well, calculator, 4.6 squared plus 7.3 squared equals 74.45. There it is, basically as a, as a trap answer. But that's x squared equals. I don't want x squared, and look at the picture. That's not 74 meters long, centimeters long. We want x equals, so I'm going to square root what's on the screen, and that gives me, to 1 dp anyway, it gives me 8.6, the units of centimeters, and there it is there at A. B, find the length of side x in the following diagram, correct to one decimal place. Well, it's a hypotenuse. Hypotenuse is always longest and opposite the right angle, so it's asking us to find the hypotenuse. And compared to the angle given, I've been given the opposite, and I'm being asked about the hypotenuse. No, none of this question is asking about the adjacent side. So I'm looking for the trig ratio that involves, compared to the angle, opposite and hypotenuse. And if I look at Sokotoa, opposite and hypotenuse is all here. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse. So sine of 62 degrees is equal to the opposite side of 21 over the hypotenuse of x. Okay, well, the x is on the bottom, so that means um, I've got to multiply the x over here, times both sides by x to get rid of the divide by x becomes x sine 62 degrees equals 21. Then to get the x by itself, I've got to divide both sides by this sine 62, because that's a times in there. So how do you get rid of a time sine 62? You divide by sine 62. And now I'm just going to go to Macau and say, what is 21 divided by sine 62? 21 divided by sine 62 equals 23 point blah, 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 blah. Yeah, it's 23.8 to 1 dp. Uh, and there it is at B. Find alpha in the following triangle correct to the nearest minute. Well, what have we got? We don't have the opposite compared to the angle we're discussing. We do have the hypotenuse and we do have the adjacent. So hypotenuse and adjacent is ka up here in B. Adjacent and hypotenuse, cos of an angle is adjacent over hypotenuse. So cos of alpha is equal to the adjacent side, which is the 4, because it's not opposite, it's adjacent, and hypotenuse is always that one. So the adjacent is 4, the, op the hypotenuse is 7. So there's alpha, or cos alpha equals 4 sevenths. How do you get rid of cos? You could do a shift cos, in other words, a cos inverse. I've got to take the cos inverse of 4 sevenths. So now if I write, sh or go the count with shift cos, 4 sevenths, and it gives me, well, initially it gives it to me as 55.15009 blah 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 degrees. But we want to the nearest minute, so I'm going to press my degrees, minutes, seconds button uh, on the Casio. On the sharp, you need to press shift and then the degrees, minutes, seconds button. But on my calculator, it now tells me it's 55 degrees. Well, it says 9 minutes and 0.34 seconds. 0.34 seconds doesn't round 9 up. I'd want up to 30 seconds to round 9 up to 10. So it's just 55 degrees, 9 minutes, no rounding up. A. Find the smallest angle in a right angle triangle of side lengths 3, 4, and 5 millimeters, correct to the nearest degree. 
Alright, here's a, a right angle triangle. I'll exaggerate the side length difference. Uh, that looks the shortest in my picture. Three, four, five. Actually, I don't think I've exaggerated. I think I've done it pretty nicely. Uh, the smallest angle. Well, the smallest angle will always be opposite the smallest side. If I had exaggerated more, like I said I was going to, that would be more obvious. If I said three, four, five, it's pretty obvious there that the smallest angle is opposite the smallest side. It might make sense to you anyway. Even if you went, oh, look, I've got no idea. If you found this angle and this angle, well, if you found this angle, you know that this plus this plus this must equal 180. So there's a few ways to find out what the shortest, the smallest angle is. You could just find them all. But I'm saying that clearly from this picture, the smallest angle is opposite the smallest side. So let's go, let's call this alpha. Um, and let's, well, we've already got the side lengths. So it doesn't matter whether I go sine, cos, or tan. I've got everything I want. Let's go tan just because you haven't played with it yet. Tan of alpha equals Sokatoa opposite over adjacent, which is 3 over 4. So now I've just got to do alpha must equal to get rid of the tan, go tan inverse. That's 3 quarters. What is tan inverse of 3 quarters? Calculator. 3 divided by 4, tan inverse of that is 36 point blah, blah, blah. In this case, nearest degree, well, it's 36.86, so that comes up to 37. 36 rounds up to 37 degrees. So there it is. Um, the other angle in the triangle would have been this trap one of 53 because 53 and 37 make the 90 degrees that's left. 90 plus these two must make 90 to make 180. Anyway, good, I think we've made the point. Uh, back one, find the angle of elevation from the point A to the top of the tree. Angle of elevations are always off the horizontal instead of looking ahead. You've got to elevate your head up by how much? Well, by this much. Let's call it beta. Alpha's had enough. Uh, we've got ourselves tan again. Tan of th, wow. Tan of beta is equal to opposite of 42 over adjacent of 57. How do you get rid of the tan? Well, it's tan inverse again. Beta equals tan inverse over 42, 1 of 57. Calculator says tan inverse of 42 divided by 57 equals, what do we want to the nearest degree? Well, it's 36.3. So that leaves 36 alone. It's 36 degrees B. Okay, the proportionality, the point minus 5 minus 4, well we crawl before we climb, someone said to me, it's x direction then y direction, so we go minus 5 in the, it's like we start the origin, minus 5 in the x direction, minus 4 in the y direction, clearly ends in the c quadrant. Which following could be the equation for this graph? Well, I know y equals root x has nothing in the negative x side, because you can't square a, a you can't square root a negative, so it's not that. Uh, y equals 4x squared. Well, I know x squareds, when we graph them, the negatives became positives again. x squareds were all parabolas. No. Y equals 2 on x. Well, if I plotted that, well, I know that at least when x is naught, 2 on naught doesn't even have an answer. So there wouldn't even be an answer here. 2 on a half uh, would be 4. 2 on 1 would be 2. So we might have a a point there in common, but no, it's, it's clearly not that. But if we look at this one, y equals 2x cubed, well, yeah, cube would look like that. Positives become positive, but negatives when they're cubed stay negatives. Let's try some. 2 times 1 cubed is 2. Great. 2 times a half cubed, well, a half by a half by a half is an eighth, and 2 eighths is a quarter. Yeah, that looks about right. 2 times minus a half uh, cubed would be minus a quarter, 2 times minus 1 cubic minus 2. Yeah, that's all the traits of a cubic. So root x's basically look like that. Y equals 2 on x are these inverse things that look like that. 4x squared, well, parabolas look like that. And x cubes look like parabolas with that's left arm swinging down. So yeah, it was c. Given that y equals k on x squared, and we've got some numbers to chuck in, find k. Well, that's pretty easy. We just will chuck in with the numbers they give us. When y equals 4, okay, that y is now a 4. That x is a 3. It says 4 equals k on 3 squared, which is 4 equals k on 3 squared is 3 by 3, which is 9. 
get the k by itself to get rid of that divide by 9, well, I'll times both sides by 9. It gives me 36 equals k. Oopsie. Ooh, I haven't left much space for this. The hours needed h to clean a house, so h is proportional to, which means equals something times, the square of the months, m. Okay, oh, I have left enough room because it doesn't go on forever. All we've got to do is, well, it's, it's definitely not C. It says M squared. It's definitely not that. That's the only one it could be at the moment, or else it's none of the above. Let's just confirm that the, the K is 2. It took 8 hours to clean the house. In other words, hours taken to clean that 8. K times when it had not been cleaned for 2 months. So that's saying when H equals 8, M equals 2. 8 equals k by m equals 2 squared. In other words, 8 equals k by 4. Get rid of a times 4 by dividing by 4. Becomes 2 equals k. Yep, absolutely. That was a 2. So it was h equals 2 m. Instead of h equals k m squared, yes, the k was a 2. Great. Variable a is inversely proportional to variable b. Well, inversely proportional to, it's still a proportional to means equals k times. But when it says inversely, that puts the other variable, instead of being here, in line with it, it puts it on the bottom. Instantly, that sentence, variable A is inversely proportional to variable B, all it does is push the B to the bottom. Any, the word inversely pushes the other variable to the bottom. Now we've got some numbers to chuck in. Variable A equals 6, so let's replace A with a 6. And replace B with a 12. How do I get that K by itself? It's being divided by a 12. So I'd better times both sides by a 12, which gives me 72 equals k, which can amend my original formula. Instead of writing k there, I write 72. A equals 72 on b. Answer b. Okay, 4. Write the equation of the following linear function of form y equals a plus bx. Now, as soon as it says write the equation, I knew I was going to use y equals a plus bx. I know a is the y-intercept, which is pretty easy. The y-intercept is the number 6. And B is the gradient. Clearly we've got a negative gradient here, because walking left to right, I'm never good at doing this person. Walking left to right on this, I'm going downhill. It's a negative gradient. And gradient is rise over run. So gradient equals rise over run. Now the run is always left to right. The run here is 3. The rise technically isn't a rise. He didn't go up, he went down. By how much? 6. So the rise is actually minus 6, so run of 3, the gradient is minus 2. Um, the other way to look at that was just look at the triangle. We know it's a minus gradient, that's obvious. And it's the vertical side on the horizontal is 6 on 2. Um, what did I, I write that wrong? It's 6 on 3. Because that's a 6, that's a 3, so it's a gradient minus 2. So let's put all that together. y equals a, which is 6, minus 2x. Done. Uh, find the gradient of the line joining those points. I could do a sketch, but let's just use our formula. Gradient is equal to y2 minus y1 of x2 minus x1. I know points are xy's, and that's an xy. You can be 1, 1, and you could be 2, 2. It doesn't matter which point we make 1 and which point we make 2. That'll do. So it's minus 5 minus 4 over 6 minus 3. Minus 5, minus 4, we're all the way back at minus 9. 6 minus 3, we're only a 3. Minus on a plus is a minus, 9 on a 3 is 3. That's the gradient. Graph that on the following number plane. Well, we know that this number that stands by itself is a y-intercept, so we've got ourselves a point right there, y-intercept of minus 1. And the gradient's minus 2. And you can think of any whole numbers over 1. So that's telling you for every 1 I go horizontally, I'm going minus 2 vertically. So for every 1 I go horizontally, I'm going minus 2 vertically. There's my new spot. For every 1 I go horizontally, I go minus 2 vertically. And I can back that up. Mm -mm. 2, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1. There's my line. I don't know if this will work. The ruler on the screen. Wow. That wasn't great. Is there an erase button on this? Oh yeah. Can I get rid of that too? Oh yeah. Uh, let's try that again. Okay, that's good enough. Let's get it off the screen so we can't see it. I can't. 
Draw a neat sketch of the line y equals 3 minus a half x on the following number plane, clearly labelling where the line crosses the x-axis and y-axis. I'm going to show you working. Well, the first bit's obvious. I mean, there's the y-intercept. The y-intercept sits by itself, and the gradient is with the x. So I can instantly just say, look, it's y equals 3. Now, to find the x-intercept, I could use the gradient and say, look, it's a minus a half. So that means minus a half gradient means for every 2 I go horizontally, but it'll go down 1. So if I go 2 horizontally, I'll be down at 1. So here if I've gone 2 across, I've only gone down 1, 2. So if I go 2 across, I go down 1, now 1. So if I go 2 across, I go down 1. So I can see that the y x-intercept is going to be 6. That's probably the harder way to do it. The easier way to do it is you can always find your y-intercept when x equals 0 and your x-intercept when y equals 0. The y-intercept is easy because it's right there. The x-intercept, I can just say find x-intercept when y equals 0. And let's get this equation. Instead of y equals 3 minus half x, I'm going to put 0 equals 3 minus a half x because y equals 0. I'm going to add half x to both sides because um, I've got a minus half x. So if I add half x to both sides, I end up with half x equals 3. The x is being times by a half, so let's divide both sides by a half. And 3 divided by half is 6. So, yeah, whether you did it, I'm going to try the ruler again. Whether you did it graphically or algebraically, hmm, I've got an x uh, intercept of 6 here, and I've got a y intercept of 3. Let's check. Is that a gradient minus a half? Yes, it's minus, and it's a side of 3 on 6. Yep, that's minus half. All good. Linear functions, five marks of this. Find A, B in the equation for the following graph. Well, A is the y-intercept. Yeah, well, it goes all the way back to naught. It cuts the y-intercept to 500. The B is just the gradient. Is that plus or minus? It's going downhill. It's a minus gradient. Let's look for some nice points. That's a nice point. Mm, that's a nice point. Let's draw a triangle here. We know it's minus, this side of the triangle is 100. The horizontal side is 20, it's a 100 on 20. That's a minus five. Um, you might have spotted this point and said, well, no, it's 200 on 40. 240 is still five and it's still negative. That gradient is negative five. Yep. So the equation, if you know the A and you know the B, the equation comes from the form y equals a plus bx but the y-axis in this case is a q the x-axis in this case is a t the a is a 500 could have left myself more room and the b is a minus 5 so q equals 500 minus 5t y-intercept yoink uh, gradient yoink q versus t perfect now oh, this is going to be good video viewing the table below shows the possible relationship between the number of customers per week at a restaurant and the net weekly profit of the restaurant. Now, when we're putting these in to the calculator, we're going to always, no matter what calculator we've got, it's like these are the X's and these are the Y's. We're going to put the, these numbers in first, these numbers in second. So when we're thinking about things, just to relate that the C is going to be like the X and P is going to be like the Y. So I've got my calculator, I've got the FX82AU, I'm just going to go to mode, stat, um, and then, where is it? It's the A plus BX button on this, or on the sharp, it's called, I think it's stat, and then reg, reg for regression, lin for linear. But anyway, we've all got our individual instructions for what calculator to use. On this one, I've got an X column, I'm going to put in 241 equals 341 equals 268 equals 382 equals and 307 equals. Then I'm going to go over to the Y column. I'm going to put 49 equals 593 equals 201 equals 760 equals and 352 equals. I've put all my data in. Uh, yep, now I'm going to press all clear, part of the instructions. Now on the Cassie, I'm going to go to shift uh, stat, which is the one key, go to five for regression. Then there's A, B, and R as my options. Well, the correlation coefficient is R. I asked the calculator what that is. R equals, and it says it's 0.99615, so on. 
correct to three decimal places, it's 0 0.996, followed by a one, I don't round it up. The y-intercept, well, I go again, shift the one key regression and select option one for A, and it tells me the one DP, it's minus 1178.4. So what does it want, the y-intercept? I don't need units. The gradient B of the line of best fit, well, I go back in to shift one regression and get 5.09, so that's 5.1. Okay, so we've got a correlation coefficient, 0.996, which means the data's fantastic. It lies up almost on a perfect straight line, which would be not number one. But now our 0.996 is brilliant data. Now, to find the equation, the line of best fit in terms of C and P, well, as soon as there's an equation, I think y equals mx plus b. And we said before, the first row is the x's, so the c's, c is the x, oops, sorry, flashback, wrong course, y equals a plus bx. Hard habit to break that one. Uh, and I know some of you are still using y equals mx plus b, and it's all fine, whatever you use, but I should speak in this way. The y's here are p's, the x's here are c's, the A here is minus 1178.4, and the B is a positive 5.1. So there's my equation. Profit, is that what this was? Yep, is equal to minus 1178.4 plus 5.1 C. So in other words, if they had no customers, the one set was saying they're losing $1,178.40. Uh, but for every customer, it goes up by $5.10. Okay. Logs, solve for x where log 232 equals 5, well left to the right equals middle, that question is 2 to the right equals 32, and 2 to what power gives 32? 2 squared is 4, 2 cubed is 8, 2 to the 4 is 16, 2 to the 5 is 32. Again, left to the right equals middle. What number times by itself 3 times to give 8? 2 does, hence y equals 2. Fully simplify some expressions, well, we, they're all log A's, so the answer is going to be log A. And we know that when it's adding, we actually multiply the numbers. So this will, 1 times 2 will be 2, and 2 times 3 will be 6. It just becomes log A6, and there's nothing I can do with that to simplify it. A to the what gives 6? I don't know. I don't know what A is. So it's simplified. Uh, the next one, well, plus was a times, but when we can bring log so the same basis together, they're both log x, but minus means divide. So 25 divided by 5 is a 5. That's the simplest form I can do. The next one I want to use the same rule as this one, but the rule doesn't include any numbers out the front. So what I can do to get them out of the way is use the third log law, which says uh, bring that power, bring that multiply from the front up to being the power of this. Because the third log law said a power can go to the front, it must go opposite too, the front can go to the power. So it becomes log 3 of 6 squared minus log 3 of 2 squared, which is the same as log 3 of, well, 6 squared is 36, minus log 3 of, well, 2 squared is 4. We've now got ourselves a question like II, which has got no numbers interfering at the front, and minus just becomes a division. They're both log 3, so it becomes log 3 of 36 divided by 4, which is a 9, and I don't stop there, I think, well, let's fully simplify. Can I answer 3 to the something gives 9? Yeah, 3 squared gives 9. So 3 to the what gives 9? The answer is 2. Now we're into question 7, exponential functions. Uh, match the equations below with the most appropriate graphs. Now, I've got a habit with these. I know that the number in front is the y-intercept. And I know that this number tells me whether it's going up or whether it's going down. It's going up if we're multiplying by something greater than 1, but it's decaying or going down if we're multiplying by a number less than 1. Now, some of them have this number in front of them. When they don't have the number in front of them, it's just a 1. It's still at a number there, we just don't bother writing 1 times. So I just write 1 times in front of ones that don't have a multiplier at the front to remind me it's got a y-intercept of 1. So let's look at the y-intercepts of 1. C and D have y-intercepts of 1. I and IV have y-intercepts of 1. Uh, which one's going up? Which one's going down? Well, if you're timesing by 3, it's going up. If you're timesing by 0 0.3, clearly, any number less than 1, you're going down. So y-intercept of 1 going up 
that's C. The wine intercept of 1 going down, that's D. Now the other two, they've both got wine intercepts of 3, absolutely. Which one's going up? Well, times 5 will be going up, that'll be the A. Times 0.2, that'll be going down, that'll be the B. On a tiny island in the Pacific, the population of rabbits is growing out of control. The number of rabbits grows exponentially according to the following function, done. So, even if I look at the questions, P equals, that letter changes, it might be mass, it might be amount, it might be whatever. It's just P for population, okay, population of rabbits. It's just like the grass up here, the initial sits here at the front, and then what it's getting times by. So there are initially 12 rabbits. Another way I could have done that, if you're not happy with that, is to say, well, what does initially mean? Initially means at the start, T equals naught. So what's the population of rabbits at t equals naught? Well, put in t equals naught. What's 1.2 to the naught? Anything to the naught is a 1, so the answer is 12 times 1. Just backing up, that the number at the front is always the initial value. How many rabbits will there be after one year? Well, we're going to use the formula. This formula just says chuck the time in, replace t with the time you're discussing, and that'll be the answer. But be careful of units. Do I just chuck 1 in there? Well, it depends what t was defined as. T was defined as time in months, not years. So it might be one year, but convert it to whatever units we're discussing. This formula was built to feed a sub in how many months. So that's what we'll do. Population equals 12 by 1.2 to the 12. So it's getting times by 1.2 12 times. That's going to be a bit of growth. 12 times 1.2 to the power of 12 equals and we're up to 106.99 uh, I think it's a fairly logical thing to round to the nearest whole number if we're talking about number of rabbits I'll just write no DP or nearest rabbit or whole number whatever you want to say but do state that you did round but how many rabbits will there be? 107 rabbits after how many months will the population double itself? a doubling time question and a half life question they're basically the same thing Let's look at the formula. P equals 12 by 1.2 to the T. If we want to know how long it will take to double itself, it's asking for T. That's the time factor. It was initially 12. We're basically asking the question, how long till it's 2 times 12? How long till it's 24? So let's replace the P with a 24. So what we're saying is, find me, solve this equation, find the time taken to make the P 24. Well, I know that I'm not allowed to do the 12 times 1.2 yet because Bodmer says I've got to do the power first, so I'm not allowed to do that. But I can divide both sides by the 12 just to simplify the things a bit. Get rid of this times 12 by dividing by 12. If I divide the left by 12, 24 and 12 is a 2. If I divide the right by 12, it disappears. And now that's a nice simple e equation. Problem with that is getting at that t, unless I'm just doing trial and error in the calculator, which is silly way to go about it, or a long way. Don't be offensive, David. Uh, let's use logs. Why? Because logs had that law that said a power can come to the front. I can't just move the t to the front if it's not logs, but if it is logs, if I write, basically just write the word log in front of the left and log in front of the right. It's still got to be equal. If 2 and 1.2t are equal, then log 2 and log 1.2t must also be equal. But now I can bring that power down. That power comes down, becomes a t times log 1.2. You can see, if I just want the t by itself, it's easy to get rid of a times log 1.2, because that's just a number. Let's divide both sides by log 1.2. So the log 2 gets divided by log 1.2, equals just t by itself. Therefore, t equals, well, what's log 2? close the bracket, divided by log 1.2 tells me it's 3.8, oh la 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 so 3.8 and I've always got to have units after how many months well the equation, the formula was created in months so I don't have any conversions to do my answer will come out in months 3.8 months cool now, what do we got? A 55 gram sample of a radioactive substance is found to decay at a rate of 2% per day. Okay, so it's initially 55 grams. And as soon as I see decay at a rate of 2% per day, I can see what's coming. If I multiply something by 100%, 2% is 
that leaves it unchanged. If I take 2% off 100%, I can see that I want it to get multiplied by 98%. A rate of decay, a drop of 2% per day, is already telling me that it's like times you by 0.98. That's 100%, which is the middle, do nothing. If it was increasing at 2%, I'll times by 102%. Decreasing by 2%, I'll times by 98%. And 98% is 0.98. Just divide by 100 to convert from a percent to a decimal. So I'm going to use that to, con to answer the first bit. Construct an exponential equation to describe the mass m in grams of this substance after time t days. The whole exponential equation thing was just, exponential equations are when the unknown, or an unknown, is in the power, to the power of t. All of these, radioactive decay, population growth, all of this chapter, this exponential topic had an unknown in the power. And they're all in some sort of form like population equals initial population times some multiplying factor to some time factor. They all look the same. In this case, it's mass equals, well, the initial mass is 55 grams. I won't actually put units into the equations. We never do that. Times the multiplying factor of 0.98 to the t, where t is in days, mass is in grams, fine, we've done it. Initial mass there, multiplying factor there, that is decaying at a rate of 2% per day, because t is in days. Done. How much of the sample will remain in 31 days? No unit conversions. The formula's in days, this question's in days. m equals 55 by 0 point, ooh, got away with that. No, I didn't really get away with that. 0.98 to the 31 and 55 times 0.98 to the 31 equals we're down to, to one decimal place 29.4 followed by a zero how much of the sample well it's a mass and it was defined in grams again always got to put units in an answer 29.4 doesn't cut it 29.4 elephants doesn't make sense you know give it its units find the half-life well like I said, it's like the doubling time for the last one. If we know the formula is m equals 55 by 0.98t, and we're saying that it starts out at 55 grams, well, we want to know when does this mass reach half of that? And half of 55 is 27.5. So my formula becomes that. Same as last time, I can't do these times yet, but I can divide both sides by 55, and 27.5 divided by 55, no big surprise, is a half. So that's always going to happen. In the doubling time question, how long till the population doubles, it ended up is, as 2 equals uh, the multiplying factor to the power of time. In this case, a half-life question, it ends up being a half equals the multiplying factor to the power of time. So it's, yeah, it's something that always happens. Same as before, I want to get the t down, so I can only do that if it's a log question. So I'm going to take log of the left and log of the right. Now I'm allowed to bring that power down, so it becomes log of the left equals t times log of the right, log 0.98. And how do I get that t by itself? I divide both sides by log 0.98. This becomes a log 0.5 on log 0.98. So t equals, go for it, a log 0.5 divided by log uh, 0.98 equals, I want 1 dp, which is 34.3, and it's a time. What's time measured in? Time is measured in days. If an amount decreases by 20% per day, what would be the multiplying factor per day? Well, we just did one that's pretty much the same. Here I said, look, doing nothing was 100%, take 2 off it. Here, doing nothing was 100%, but we're saying take 20 off it. So we're talking about, we want to find 80% of the item. Each day if it loses 20%, um, we're times it by 80%. So the multiplying factor is just 0.8. Hmm. You could call it 80%, it's the same answer. You could say the multiplying factor is 80%. Same thing as 0.8. 8 tenths, do as you feel. A bank is offering 9% per annum interest compounded monthly. That's in bold because in these interest questions, whatever rate it's compounded by, we convert everything to it. So I'm just going to scan the question. If Ruprecht invests $800 in the bank, how much will his investment be worth in five years? Compounded monthly. I don't care about five years. 
So there's 12 months in every year, five trials at 60 months. What else? 9% per annum. I don't care how much you'll get per year. I want per month. If you get 9% for a whole year, but it's only going to, how much will I get for a month? Only a twelfth of that. So it's nine twelfths percent, okay? Which you might want to call three quarters, you might want to call 0.75%, whatever you want to do. Um, so in this case, the formula will be how much of investment you're worth. I'm going to do A equals amount of money, that'll do. The initial amount is $800 times a multiplying factor is, well, it's only a 0.75%. Um, so and it's increasing by. So it's 100 plus 0.75%. Well, that's 100.75%. And what's that as a decimal? That on 100 to the power of time. In this case, the power of 60. Now, I just built that manually, but you might want to have used the formula. A equals P outside of 1 plus R to the N. And that's cool. The principal amount here is $800 investment. Then it's 1 plus a rate of 0.75%. I know it's a tiny number. 0.75 on 100. So that's just convenient to a decimal. I know 0.75 is already a, looks like a decimal, but it was a percent. 0.75% is 0.0075 as a decimal because that's how we convert percents to decimals. I hate it when the numbers are that low, people want to doubt themselves, but we're just doing exactly the same as any other question. Just the interest rate is very low per month. Um, so whichever one of these I stick into the calculator, it's exactly the same thing. Uh, one plus 0.75 over 100. The calculator says 1.0075, which is exactly the same as this, to the 60, and it gets times by 800. So the amount of money coming out with either method, correct the nearest cent, is 1252.54. The next numbers are four, so we don't round the 54 up. Dollars, yes, we've got to put that on there. And it told us to round to the nearest cent, and we did. Now, I'll also check, sometimes it says, it might say, you know, what interest was earned. So we'd have to take the 800 back off it. But no, it just says how much will the investment be worth. That's true. It was worth 800, now it's worth 1252.54. Now a bank's offering 5% per annum interest compounded yearly. Okay, so compounded yearly per annum. That's good. I don't need to change that. Four years' time, I don't need to change that. Okay, there's no unit changing going on. It's all in years. But how much should I invest? It's actually the principal we're not being told. So I'll go for that same formula here. If I say A equals P, 1 plus R to the N. We're saying that we want to know how much you invest P, so the account will contain $2,000 in four years' time. So the final amount of the investment is 2000 P is, I don't know, 1 plus the rate is 5%, and the N is four years. I still could have done it manually. If I did it manually, I would have said the final amount's that, the initial amount is I don't know, and I would have said increasing by 5% is times it by 1.05. And again, 1 plus 5 on 100 is 1.05. Whether you use the formula or just exponential equation construction, we're all good. But here I want the P by itself. It's being times by 1.05 to the 4. So let's divide both sides by 1.05 to the 4. Divide by 1.05 to the 4. Calculator can do this for me. 2,000 divided by 1.05 to the 4 equals 1645.40. Once again, followed by four, so we don't round up. That's dollars. And make sure it makes sense. Make sure the answer is less than what you're going to get. It's saying if I invest 1645.40, it will become 2000. Yeah, I'm fine with that. Um, hmm. Okay, the following pie chart, water. Pauline pie chart shows the raw data from survey of students preferred subject areas. Preferred subject areas of 540 UN students. Okay. How many degrees of the circle does maths occupy? Well, what we've got here is that's not 165 degrees. 165 plus 180 plus 135 plus 60 is the 540 UN students. So what fraction of the circle is maths? Well, it's 165 people out of the 540 people. 
So that's the fraction of the circle contained by maths. How many full degrees in a full circle? I know it's 360. So it should be that fraction of all of the 360 degrees will tell me uh, how many degrees should be maths. 165 divided by 540. Um, and then it's getting times by 360. And it says 110 degrees. So that must be about 110 degrees. Okay, fair enough. If 14 people change their mind from humanities to maths. So 14 people, uh, I could do it this way. There's two ways to do it. I could say, okay, 14 people are taking their opinion from there and giving it to maths. Um, good call. So I'm going to add 14 to this. becomes 179. I'll take 14 off this, which becomes 166. And then the new maths percentage will be, well, now it's 179 out of 540. What would be the new maths percentage? Well, we never calculated an old maths percentage, so poor question, David. But the new maths percentage will be 179 over 540. Uh, and times by 100 just to turn it into a percent. So 179 divided by 540 equals, well, times by 100. Uh, the new mass percentage will be 33.1% uh, percent to one decimal place as requested. Okay, um, what I was going to say for the other method was we could have calculated the old maths percent, which was this times 100, 165 divided by 540 equals, so that was 30.5 repeater percent, and then say, well, let's add a new percent to it. If 14 people change their mind, what percent is that? Well, 14 people out of 540 is 14 out of 540 times 100, which is 14 divided by 540 uh, times 100, which is 2.6%. I've just rounded there. And if we add them up, it'll become this. But really, the way we just did it first time, that made sense. Just say, look, the new number is 179. It's on 540. That was a pretty simple way to go. If another 24 people were surveyed, uh, these are new 24 people, and 12 of them said they preferred art, what's the new art percentage? Well, what's, what's, what's art? Art's 60. So 60 for art is getting 12 more people. So art's become 72. But don't compare it to the old total anymore. It's not 540 people anymore. We scored an extra 24 people. Only 12 added to the art number of 60, but 24 people have been added to the total. So instead of 540, it's now 564. And times by 100 to turn the fraction into a percent. 72 divided by 564 equals, divided by, I mean, times by 100. So it gives me 12.76, so that's 12.8%. Rounded to one decimal place. Hmm. The following table shows a selection of results from a test out of five marks. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5. But there's four of them, six of them, so initially don't think one, two, three, four, five, six, that there are six people. No, it's not one person got each mark, it's just there, the range of marks that happen. Four of them happen, six ones, three twos, and so on. So what's the total number of people in this uh, class? 10 plus 3 is 13, 16, 19, there are 20 results here. Let's fill in the CF column and the FX. Cumulative frequency, well, there's four scores so far. Plus six more scores is 10, plus three more scores is 13, plus three more 16, plus three more 19, plus one more 20. There's a bit of a check. We should always finish on the same number as the total F. And the FX literally just means F times X. Four times naught is naught. Six lots of one is six. Three lots of two is six. Three lots of three is nine. Three lots of four is 12. One lot of five is five. So basically the sum of this is just the sum of all the numbers that we have all the results. And if I add them up, I've got 12, 24, 29, 38. Here's the table to calculate the following, the range of the data. Well, the range is the highest bit of data minus the lowest bit of data. The highest score, yep, five happened, only once, but it happened. Nought happened four times, so yep. The range of the data is maximum score minus minimum score, which is five minus naught, which is five. The mode is the most popular score that happened, and the highest frequency is six. In other words, one happened more than any other score. Give a reason for your answer. Um, happened uh, the most. 
equals six times. The median, well the median's a middle score. If I've got an even number of scores, I know there's two scores in the middle, and the middle of the 20 scores is the 10th and the 11th. So let's look at our CF column. What's the 10th and 11th scores? CF of 10. So the 10th, 10 in the CF column says the 10th score was a one, the 11th, 12th, and 13th must have all been twos. So the 10th was a one, the 11th is a two, hence the median is 1.5. Give a reason for your answer? Well, that, that, that working is a reason. I didn't just write 1.5. The reason is because the 10th is one, the 11th is two. And the mean, well, we know the mean is a sum of all numbers divided by how many numbers? We know that the FX column just sums all the numbers up for us, so all of the data add up to 38, and how many scores were there? We know there were 20 people did it, so it's 38 on 20. So the mean is 38 on 20, which is 19 on 10, so it's a 1.9. The mean result is 1.9. Again, does it doesn't make sense? Yeah, I mean, the, most people got ones, and there's two, yeah. A 1.9 sounds about right for scores from 0 to 5. What's the range of this data? Well, it's not in order. I'm going to write it in order to make sure I don't fall in traps. 1, 2, 3, 4, 10. Did I get them all? 1, 2, 3, 4, 10. So the range of the data, highest minus lowest, 10 minus 1 equals 9. The mean of the data, well, I better add them all up and divide by how many there are. 1 plus 2 is 3, plus 3 is 6, plus 4 is 10, plus 10 is 20. Divided by, there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 scores, so the mean is 4. Complete the following table. Well, there's the scores laid out for us, 1, 2, 3, 4, 10. This column, column says, take the scores and take the mean off it. Well, the mean is 4. 1 minus 4 is a minus 3. 2 minus 4 is a minus 2. 3 minus 4 is a minus 1. 4 minus 4 is 0. And 10 minus 4 is 6. The next column's got exactly the same heading, but squared. So it says, get each of these and square it. In other words, minus 3 times itself becomes plus 9. Minus 2 times minus 2 is plus 4. Minus 1 by minus 1 is 1. Naught noughts is naught. And 6 6 is a 36. It's also left a space for me to sum them up. 36 plus 1 plus 4. We've got 41 plus 9 is 50. Use the table in 3 to calculate the population standard deviation of the data. Correct to one decimal place. Well, we had the formula... Um, you don't have to use a formula here, but if you write down the formula, the population standard deviation was the square root of the sum of, of x minus x bar squared over n. And all that was saying was, well, what's the, this mean? The sum of x minus x bar squared, that's the sum of x minus x bar squared. It's x minus x bar squared column, and this big sigma means sum them up. So the number on the top is just a 50. The n means the number of scores, and there was only 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and it says to square root it. So it's 50 on 5 is 10, so it's the square root of 10. Once it's correct to one decimal place, what's root 10? Standard deviation is only 3.16, which to one decimal place is 3.2. Hmm. What category of data would time spent studying per week be classified as? Well, we might have naught hours, I hope not. One hour, two hours, three hours. What are, these are the category names, time spent. And then we'll have frequencies here. Two people said that, four people said that, seven, whatever. But this is category of data is about the, the categories of uh, results you're finding. If they're numerical measures, they're quantitative. If there are words like dog, cat, pig, as pets, whatever, that'd be qualitative. But this is definitely quantitative. And continuous is when you can have any sort of uh, answer, like if I was saying, what's your height? You could have the answer 1.723 centimetres. You could have infinite number of answers. Discrete is when only certain numbers are relevant answers. And this is definitely discrete because time spent... Oh, no, what am I doing? Time spent studying per week, we classify it as. I just... Uh, I didn't read my own question properly. I'm not going to edit that out. That was my own screw up. Time spent studying per week. Here's me saying it could be naught hours, one hours, two hours, three hours. I might arrange my data that way, but the question didn't say that. Time spent studying per week could be 2.38 hours, could be any result. So it's actually quantitative continuous. 
if I said um, time spent studying per week to nearest hour, and I made them groups, <laughs> I can't say groups and write hour, and I said my categories were naught or one or two or three, that's discrete, certain categories. But this open-ended question I've got, time spent studying per week, did not say uh, that we were defining them to the nearest hour. I could give you any answer. That's quantitative continuous. Hmm. Read your own questions, David. Question nine, the following cumulative frequency screen was question. Okay. Draw the A guy for this data on the graph above. Is it frequency or cumulative frequency? When it's frequency, I join the dots in the middle. When it's cumulative frequency, I go corner to corner. And this one is cumulative frequency. So corner to corner says do that, and then it goes flat, and then it goes there, and then there, and then, ooh, very, f oh, that was terrible. And then corner to corner, and then, yeah, if I'm using a ruler, why does it look curved? And then that, and then, and then. All right, OGO I've done. Use the OGO to estimate the median of this data. Well, that's the center of the data. How much data? It's not 70, it only stops at 60. So the median will go to the halfway mark, which is 30, take it across till it hits the OGO, and then take it down. Which, to, if that's 70, 80, that's 75, it looks about 72 to me. I could put it approximately equal to. Everyone's going to get slightly different answers, but 72 looks good to me. What's Q3 for this data? Well, Q3 is the third quartile. The first quartile would be half of 30, which is 15, go across and down. Then we've got 30. Then the third would be 45. Because if I just get 60 and divide it by 4, it gives 15. So, yeah, to split this data up into four equal bits, it's 15 bits. 15, 15, 15, 15. The third quartile will be go across here at 45, hit the ogive, which is red, and it hits it right there. Flat bang on 80. What's Q3 for this data? 80. What's the interquartile range? Well, I know the interquartile range is defined as Q3 minus Q1, which is Q3 of 80 minus, well, let's go Q1. I already said Q1 was going to be from the 15 point till it hits the A guy, and there it is hitting it right there. So it's 40. It's 80 minus 40, and 80 minus 40 is 40. Hmm. For that data, is it in order? Do, 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 do. Yes, it is. Use your calculator to find the sample standard deviation of the data. This time it was sample. I know the population sta uh, standard deviation that we used before, population was that sigma symbol. Uh, sample, well, sometimes it's written sigma n minus 1, sometimes it's written with an s. Depends what calculator you've got, but it, just get to know your own calculator. There's two uh, standard deviations on there. Just know which is the population, which is the sample. Population is also written as sigma n, but the n minus 1 or the little s always goes with sample. So I've just got to do another fascinating uh, video of me in the background doing data entry, and I go to stats and one variable. And we go 11, down 11, 12, 15, 16, 18, 22, 29, 30, 39, 45, 51, 53. All right, they're all gone on the cow. Can I press all clear? I go into shift one go to 4 for variance, and on this Casio, it's, it's option 4, it says SX. Uh, and it tells me it's 15.258, so the 5 comes up, 15.26. What's the value of the lower quartile and the upper quartile? Well, I'd better split it up then. How many bits of data we got? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Well, I know... 12 bits of data splits into a 6 and a 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So you've got 6 on the left and 6 on the right. So just for interest's sake, uh, Q2 is going to sit right here. And what's halfway between 22 and 29? Well, let's just add them and halve them. 
they add up to give 51 and half of that is 25 and a half. Okay, uh, now what's the half of the data to the left of that? Well, it's going to be right here. We'd say Q1 is 15 and a half, halfway between 15 and 16. Q3 will be there, halfway between 39 and 45, which would find out would be 42. So what's the Q1? Uh, 15 and a half. Upper quartile, 42. Inter quartile range we know is Q3 minus Q1, uh, which is 42 minus 15.5. We've got ourselves a 26 and a half. Give the five number summary. Well, all that is is the min Q1, Q2, Q3 max. The minimum's 11. The maximum's 53. And if I scroll down a bit, Q1, Q2, Q3 are 15 and a half, 25 and a half, and 42. 15 and a half, 25 and a half, and 42. And sketch a box plot. A box plot is just the graphic of the five number summary. So I've got 11, let's check how far, that's five gaps in from 10 to 20, so that means it's uh, two per gap, so 11 must be halfway between, 11's there, uh, so it's 12, 14, 16, 15 and a half would be about there, 25 and a half, 22, 24, 26, 25 and a half, um, 42, and 53. 50, 52, 54, 53. And then I'll try and do some little lines here. And mm hmm. And mm hmm. Box plot done. A breakfast cereal company determined that the mean weight of their cereal boxes was 646 grams. The mean was 646. Okay, with a standard deviation of four, so I'm jumping up by fours and down by fours. 650, oop, 654, 658, 642, 638, 634. Uh, and the percents here are given to us, but I know those unique numbers. There's 34. Now the lecture notes, we've got a 13.5%. 13.5%, a 2.35%, 2.35%, and a 0.15%. 0.15%. Okay, what percentage of boxes we were expected to contain a weight contain between 646 and 650? 34%. Straight off the pick. What percent of boxes do you expect to contain between 638? And 646, well 638's down here, 646 is here, that's just covering two of these segments. 34 plus 13.5 is 47.5%. The boxes are advertised as containing 638 grams of cereal. How many boxes per day will contain less than this amount? Well less than 638 is this range here. 2.35 plus 0.15, that's 2.5% of the boxes I would expect to be uh, less than 638. If they produce 5,000 boxes of cereal per day, then 2.5% of that amount will contain less per day. What is, I'll just go to the count, 2.5% is 2.5 divided by 100, and we're times it by 5,000. So it's 125 boxes uh, that will contain less than this amount per day. Six. The marks from a test are normally distributed with a mean of 62 and a standard deviation of 6. We can go for the formula or the picture. I still like the picture. I like to go, look, the mean is 62 and the standard deviation is 6 and we're talking about a negative z-score. So I'm talking about a negative 1 z-score would be, because a naught z-score is the mean, negative 1 is 1 standard deviation below. 62 minus 6 would be 56. The standard deviation of minus 2 z-score will be another 6 below which is 50. A standard deviation, uh, z-score minus 3 will be another 6 below which will be 44. So let's just check my numbers, plus 6, plus 6, plus 6, everything's good. Where does minus 2.5 sit? Well, between minus 2 and minus 3. 
between 50 and 44, which is 47. So there's me using the picture. Okay, actual marker 47, or I could have used the formula. Z equals X minus X bar on standard deviation. So the Z of minus two and a half equals the score of, that's the question, minus the mean of 62 over the standard deviation of six. Let's do a bit of algebra. Let's get rid of this divide by six by timesing both sides by six. Six times minus two and a half will be minus 15 equals X minus 62. And now to get rid of the minus 62 to get the X by itself, let's plus 62 to both sides, which becomes X equals minus 15 plus 62. Yeah, it's 47. Um, great, whichever way you wanted to go. In an English exam, the mean was mark was 75, standard deviation is four. What were the Z scores for the following? Again, I could do that picture or I could just go for the formula. Um, let's just go for the formula. The Z score equals the score we're discussing minus the mean over the standard deviation. 67 minus 75 is minus eight over four, and minus eight over four is minus two, which means is 67, two standard deviations below the mean? Yeah, two standard deviations, that's eight. 75 minus eight is 67, yeah it was. Right on, but it won't always be perfect. This one's an easy one though. The mean mark was 75. What's a Z score for getting a 75? It's naught. If you get the mean, it's a Z score of naught. The formula will do it anyway. If we're talking about 75, subtracting the mean and dividing by the standard deviation, we get naught on four. How many fours are in naught? Naught. 10, probability, uh, one. We don't do probability two this year, so last question. You roll a fair die, single or dice, just making sure, 50 times. What's the probability that you get a multiple of three on the first roll? Well, I know my sample space is one, two, three, four, five, six. And we need to know that a multiple of three is defined by a whole number times three. Three is a multiple of three, six is a multiple of three, so is nine, so is 12, so on, but there's only two answers here that are a multiple of three. So that's two out of six is the probability of getting a multiple of three. And to work out expectation, oh, sorry, we're not there yet, don't jump ahead. What's the probability you get a multiple of three on the first roll? Two sixths. Simplify it if you want, but it doesn't matter. How many times would you expect to get that result? Well, that's when you get the probability, times it by the number of times you're attempting it, and say, that will be my expectation. But if I go to the calculator and say, what's a third of 50? It'll give me the answer of 16.6 repeater. And we know that I'm not going to roll it 16.6 repeated times. That answer doesn't make sense. I only, it's a, this is discrete data, only certain categories of potential answers, and it's got to be a whole number. What's the closest whole number to 16.6? 17 times. Absolutely. If it was 16.5, I would have quoted 16 or 17 times because they're both equally as likely. But you go for the closest whole number, in this case, 17 times. B, you are selected, you are requested, sorry, to select a card at random from a standard deck of cards. What's the probability that you select a black four? Well, I've just got to think how many black fours are in a pack. There's four fours, but only two of them black. Two out of all 52 cards. Again, simplify it if you want, but no need. What's the probability that you select a six or a black card? Here's our picture, how many black cards and sixes I've got. And I either, I could picture, I might have it on my resource sheet and I've got all my black cards uh, and my red cards and that. And I'll see that, oh, there's 26 black cards and there's two more sixes. So I could see just by adding them up, 28 cards are either black or sixes. And that would be my answer. Or I could say, look, how many sixes are there? There's four out of 52. Plus how many black cards are there? There's 26 out of 52. But subtract the overlap between them. How many are both? six and black cards and there are two because there are two black sixes in these four sixes and there are two black sixes in these 26 cards so you don't want to count them twice so that's four plus 26 is 30 minus two is 28 so you may have a preference probably it's just looking at the diagram but if it's a formula fantastic a survey was conducted on the transport choices for 60 people on a small island Okay, 26 cyclists, 36 motorists, 9 were neither cyclists nor motorists. 
So some might have been both. Let's find out. Construct a Venn diagram. It's always got to have headings. It's always going to be clear. There's going to be two main categories. One of them is cyclists, one of them is motorists. The question said nine were neither. Well, that makes it easier. I've just got to put a nine there. Um, and I know that there's 60 people in total, so I'm just going to note that there to make sure that my numbers add up to 60. So, so far we're saying, look, 26 were cyclists, 36 were motorists, and 9 were neither. What do they add up to? Well, I've got 1221, 5, 6, 7. Okay, there's 71 people, supposedly in the survey, 71 results. But there's only actually 60 people, 71 we can't have 71 results. That bit that seems to be an error must be people that put their hand up twice. And the only overlap we've got in this diagram is between C and M. 11 of the cyclists must also have been motorists. So whatever seems to be a discrepancy in the numbers is going to be yeah, the overlap, the people who put their hand up twice and got counted twice. 11 of these 26 people were also counted in the 36. So hence, well, if 26 were cyclists, the cyclist 30 circle must have 26 in it. If there's 11 already there, 15, 11, make that 26. The motorist circle should have 36 in it. So take 11 off the 36, says I should put a 25 there. So now the M circle has 36. Now let's add them all up and check that they do add to 60. 15 plus 11 is 26, plus 25 is 51, plus 9 is 60. Yep, love my Venn diagram. Now, if a person were chosen at random from the above survey, determine the probability that the person is a cyclist or a motorist only. So, is a cyclist or a motorist only? Not both, not neither. Cyclist or motorist only. Well, it's 15 plus 25, which is 40, out of the total number of people in the survey. Simplify it if you want. Again, no need. Now, the next question is, what's the probability of picking a someone who is also a motorist, given that they're a cyclist. Given that they're a cyclist says, we're being told that we're only talking about the cyclists. Nothing else exists now. In other words, given that they're a cyclist, they're talking about out of this lot of people, which is only 26 people, what's the probability of selecting one of that group and they're also a motorist? Well, 11 of these people were also a motorist. 11 out of the 26 we're discussing. D, a barrel of apples contains a mixture of red and green apples. However, not all the apples are edible because some of them are rotten. Okay, there are 25 red apples. Red apples, there are 25. And 40 green apples. Okay. Why did I leave a box there and there? Come on, David. Uh, so in other words, are there only red or green? So we've got 65 apples in total. Great. Five of the red apples and 10 of the green apples were rotten. So five of the red apples were rotten. 10 of the green apples were rotten, so we can fill in. So rotten apples, there are only 15 of them. 5 plus what gives 25? 20. 10 plus what gives 40? 30. 20 plus 30 is 50. Does everything add up? 15 and 50 give 65, yep. 25 and 40 give 65. Fantastic. Complete the consensus table. Again, um, if an apple is chosen at random, what is the probability that the apple is green and not rotten? Green, not rotten, 30. There are 30 apples that are green and not rotten. 30 out of 65, that's my probability. I choose not to simplify. If an apple is chosen at random, what's the probability that the apple is red? Okay, there's nothing conditional in there. It's just, what's the chance you get a red apple? Well, there are 25 red apples out of 65 apples. Done. If I choose a green apple, okay, if I choose a green apple, nothing else exists. We're being told we're choosing a green apple. So there's only 40 possibilities here. What's the probability that is rotten? Well, 30, I mean 10 are rotten out of the 40 green apples. That's it. A bag contains five red marbles and seven blue marbles. I just like to write five red, seven blue. Two marbles are selected from the bag. The first one is not replaced while the second marble is selected. Draw a tree diagram. Okay. We're going to get red or blue. Not equal probability, so we're going to have to write stuff on the arms. Red, blue, red, blue. 
the chance of getting a red apple initially is 5 out of the total number of apples, which is 5 plus 7, which is 12. I've got a 5 in 12 chance of getting a red apple. But I've got a 7 uh, apple, <laughs> red marble. I've got a 7 in 12 chance of getting a blue marble. Great. Now let's fill this in. If I did pick a red marble, now there's only 4 red marbles to pick. And I didn't replace it, so there's only 11 in the bag. There were seven blue marbles, so there's still seven blue marbles out of 11. And four 11s plus seven 11s add up to 11 11s, so that's just a check that everything's good. Uh, if I did pull out a blue marble, there were seven out of 12. Now one's gone, there's only six out of 11 left. Even without looking at anything else, I know this must be five on 11, because six and five make 11. But yeah, that's true, there were five red apples. Stop it, there were five red marbles. Um, I didn't pull out a red marble, so there's still five, but it's out of only 11. So there's my tree diagram. While I'm at it, I'm just going to fill in red, 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 blue, blue, red, and blue, blue. And I'm going to write, even though it didn't ask me to, this isn't part of the answer. I just want to write the outcome of multiplying these arms, just to help me answer the questions. 5 twelfths times 4 elevenths, well it's 5 by 4 on the top, and I'm pretty sure 11 twelfths is 132. 5 by 7 on top is 35 on 132. 7 by 5 is 35 on 132. And 7 by 6 is 42 on 132. And I want to check that all my numerators do add up to 132. It's 35 and 35 is 70, plus 20 is 90, plus 42 is 132. That, I've gone over the top. The only thing I needed to do to answer that question was this bit. But I like doing the other just to help me answer the stuff. From the probability of selecting two blue marbles, I've already answered that, and I've already got my working there. It's 42 out of 132, blue and blue. From the probability of it selecting at most one blue marble, well, there's going to be two ways to do it. At most, one blue marble means you can have one blue marble, but no more. We don't care if you have no blue marbles or one blue marble, but we definitely don't want two. So actually, this question is saying, Look, at most one blue marble, it's this answer, plus this answer, plus two reds is okay. So it's your choice. You can either add up these three answers and get it, or you can say, well, it's one minus this answer, because that's the only one that's not in there. If I add all of these up, I get 35 and 30, or 70 plus 20, I get 90 on 132. Or I could have just said, no, it's one minus my previous answer, one minus 42 on 132, which you'll find anyway is 90 on 132. And we're done. Okay, all the best with it. See ya.